Well, thank you everybody for sticking around. We've got our third uh, talk in this session. Tom Oxberger from Microsoft is going to talk all about scalable geospatial analysis. I'm particularly interested uh, in this because I've done some geospatial stuff with Dasco. I'd love to kind of hear uh, what other people are doing and seeing this use case. So go ahead, Tom, you can take it away. All righty, thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, scalable geospatial analysis with DAS. So uh, a kind of alternative title is uh, Tom learns geospatial and dis discover some cool things that you can do uh, with DAS in, in mind specifically. So it'll be a bit haphazard, but I think it'll be a fun uh, talk nonetheless. Um, first of all, Sorry, yeah. Just one thing. Um, if you're intending to show your video, it's not on. Totally up to you if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. just let you know. Yeah, there we go. How's that? Yep, now we can awesome. see. It. Thanks. I don't know if that makes it better or worse. Um, okay, so I um, want to thank uh, Microsoft. So we're sponsoring uh, this talk. And then also, like more importantly, I think, um, are, are like continuing to be involved with the community uh, of, of users who are trying to do geospatial stuff. So I work on the AI for Earth team, where we're um, trying to, to help people succeed in doing kind of conservation and sustainability workloads, which inherently are, are, are geospatial, uh, oftentimes are geospatial, um, and we want them to be able to succeed to do that uh, on Azure. Um, so the different parts of the planetary computer, which will be relevant to, to what we're doing today, um, are first and foremost the data. So we've got tons and tons of data uh, data in, in Azure blob storage, um, mostly like public sector data sets. So remote sensing missions like uh, Landsat and Sentinel, um, various other kinds, which we'll see. Um, so all that, that data is there in blob storage for, for people doing, you know, sustainability research and policy making to, to use. Uh, but we didn't want to just stop there. We wanted to like actually make that data usable. And so we also are embracing this uh, emerging standard called Stack Spatial Temporal Asset Catalog for um, kind of a structured catalog of what's actually, you know, what those bytes on disk actually are, what they represent. Uh, we'll see that in detail in a bit. Um, and then also we're taking lessons learned by communities like uh, Pangeo around um, making it easy to compute on this data uh, in a cloud native way. So things like a Jupyter Hub for you know, logging in and, and you get access to an environment with all of, hopefully all of your packages there to go. And then if you need to scale out to uh, cluster machines, there's a uh, Dask is there is there for you. Um, and then, you know, just all these ideas around cloud native geoscience on, on these large data sets. Um, uh, in, a, in an attempt to like make a coherent thought behind this talk, you know, Jake Vanderplas has this really nice uh, talk from PyCon a few years ago. Um, and, and one of the themes he hits upon is like, we're very fortunate to have these uh, core set of libraries like, like NumPy and you know, Pandas and X-Ray built on top of NumPy um, at the, the core of the stack. And then going outwards from there, we have all these domain specific libraries uh, and this kind of gives us the best of both worlds. So we can you know, have expressive APIs that are tailored to our specific domain. Uh, you know, and it, you know, jutting out from X-Ray, it's not on here, but there's tons and tons of geospatial specific stuff built on top of X-Ray and pandas and geopandas, things like that. So we have these core libraries that provide generic data structures that work well on many types of data uh, and then domain specific libraries built on top of those. Um, I think that's like really valuable because we get to, you know, we can train a model in scikit-learn and plot it in, with matplotlib and not have to copy data. And like, that's a very obvious um, way that we benefit from these core set of, of uh, data structures at the heart of this ecosystem. Uh, but there are also things like when DAS comes in, you know, a few years ago or hand longer than that now, uh, and wants to like parallelize this whole ecosystem, you know, there's many, many communities who are facing scaling challenges, uh, but we're able to talk to them and then kind of act as like a broker. We can also go and talk to pandas maintainers and NumPy maintainers and see what needs to be done to kind of scale this whole ecosystem. Uh, so anyway, that's like a, a brief uh, thing that'll connect together the rest of this talk, hopefully. Okay, so diving in in detail into stack here, uh, spatial temporal asset catalog. Um, if you have some sort of geospatial like workflow or question that you want to answer, um, typically you'll go through a story somewhat like this. You know, I need some data that covers some region, some area of interest over some time period. 
um, making that a bit more concrete, say you need data from Landsat 8 collection to level two, it's a specific satellite uh, covering this bounding box over this you know, 2016 to 2020. Okay, so uh, that's like very natural way to, to think about the problem. Uh, but the issue is like, if you go to uh, blob storage, you know, these are the raw files from, from Sentinel. So it's like a whole bunch of cloud optimized geotiffs, but it's, it's you know, if you squint hard enough, you'll see there is some structure there. There's like a date somewhere in this file and something about the file path indicates like which uh, region of earth it's over. Um, anyway, it's like not the, the friendliest way to, to work with this data. Um, just having the, the bytes on disk is, you know, major accomplishment. These are huge data sets, but um, to actually unlock the value within, you know, we're gonna want some nicer APIs to work with the data. Um, and so that's where, where stack, uh, one of the ways stack comes in is it's like this structured way to describe these spatial temporal data sets. And once you have that structure, you can build things on top of it, like endpoints for querying that data and clients for, for doing that querying. Um, so in this case, we're using this open source library, PyStack client to connect to this endpoint. Um, this is a public endpoint. So anybody can, can connect to this endpoint and uh, query um, and look at the, the stack uh, catalog. Uh, of the data that we host. And again, going back to our little story here, you know, it's very natural to, to say, you know, I want this data, Landsat, covering this bounding box over this time period uh, and get those back as, as a bunch of items. So, uh, you know, going from, you know, the potentially millions of files in blob storage, um, maybe, yeah, tons, tons and tons of files in blob storage, uh, URLs in blob storage to, to these structured items is like really nice uh, to work with this geospatial data. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, we've got this uh, Python objects that contain these URLs. So we're kind of, we've narrowed down those millions of images just to a subset, uh, but we do still have some issues here of like, if I go to open this file with, with Rasterio, it has to like make some HTTP requests and do some metadata lookups. And it's, anyway, it, it ends up taking quite a while, almost a second to open up a single file. And that's just reading the metadata. It's not even reading the actual data, the, the you know, Indie array of data itself. Um, so that's not, you know, our, our search had like 350 items. So five, five minutes to open up a single uh, data set is, is a little painful. And we're, we're used to like czar where we can open up, you know, terabyte sized data sets in less than a second. So um, brief pop quiz here, uh, if you want, uh, I'll, I'll give you a sec to think about it. True or false, Dask is, is lazy. Uh, so this is like, yeah, maybe thinking to yourself, obviously Dask is lazy, right? But then... Why would he ask it? Is it a trick question? Sure, it, it is a trick question, kind of. So I, I would say true with an asterisk or false with an asterisk, uh, depending on how strict you want to be about, about lazy. Um, anytime Zar or X-ray is doing, sorry, anytime Dask is doing some sort of IO to read in some data from some file system, uh, it's going to do a bit of IO. So if you're reading from a Zar file, uh, it's going to, there's like a metadata file that says, you know, what, what the data type is, what the chunking structure is, things like that. Uh, if you read from Parquet, there's some various metadata files that has things like the column names, D types, partitioning, that sort of stuff. If you do read CSV, it actually reads a bunch of bytes and then uses pandas to infer the column names and the, the D types. So uh, Dask will do a bit of IO uh, up front, uh, but the key is it does just enough IO to construct the metadata. So the column names, the D types, the chunking structure, things like that. And then after that, subsequent operations are going to be lazy. Okay. So kind of jumping back to our, our uh, problem we were having there, where we open up this, this URL uh, just to read the metadata from the cloud optimized geotiff, um, you know, we, we can actually avoid that again, thanks to stack. So there's a whole bunch of metadata in the stack item. It's like this JSON uh, structure with you know well-defined semantics, and we have things like the EPSG code, so the the projection information, and things like the shape uh, of the array. And if you're familiar with Rasterial, this will uh, maybe make some sense. But uh, these numbers define like the top left corner of the array, and then we have like the resolution and the x and the y direction and the bands and the daytime. And with all this information, we're able, we actually have enough information to take a collection of stack items and build it and turn it into an X-ray data array. We have things like the data types and the shapes and the chunking and how these all lay out together on a map, uh, you know, either in, in space or, or a stack in time. 
Um, and I um, love uh, this, Gabe Joseph wrote this library, Gabe from Coiled, um, called Stack Stack. It's just a, a great, great library. It does what it does so well is it takes a stack of uh, stack items and stacks them together into a data array. And so you just pass it this list of items and it, it goes through them, it collects all the metadata and it builds up the data array without opening any files. And so like, that's the, the key thing there. Um, we'll actually uh, jump over here to uh, this, this notebook and see that in action. So um, again, we have like a very Pangeo-like deployment here on uh, the planetary computer. I'll talk more about that at the end if there's time, but basic ideas. We've got this, uh, in this case, we'll be working with Landsat's um, data that's uh, again, hosted in the planetary computer and we'll see stack stack in action. So um, if you're not familiar um, with like the Pangeo deployments um, that are out there, uh, in this case, it's a Jupyter Hub uh, deployed with Dask Gateway. Um, so users can just ask for, for clusters and uh, magic will happen in the background. Hopefully uh, workers will come online and then you'll, you'll just get your Dask cluster there. Um, so I've defined this area of interest uh, as a um, GeoJSON object um, covers a portion of Southeast Iowa. And we're going to use uh, the stack endpoint to go ahead and select the data that we care about. So again, Landsat 8 over that bounding box, over that region. OK, this will take like four or five seconds to go through. Um, we have some optimization to do. Like this is, uh, we can get this down even lower. Um, but anyway, we, we found a few 400, 450 items that matched our, our query. Each of those items has you know, all that rich metadata I was talking about. So it definitely does have the URL, but also has lots of things uh, that we need to use, uh, that we can use to construct the data array without opening any actual files. Okay, there's one slight wrinkle here. Um, we've got more docs here, but this data is publicly accessible, but you do need to sign your request, uh, basically so that somebody doesn't like try and download all of Landsat out of West Europe, which is where the data is stored. Um, if you have an account, you're in West Europe, you're, you're totally fine. You're not going to be throttled. Uh, but if you're, you know, like anonymous access, it, it, we just throttle the signing so that uh, we can uh, cut you off before you uh, blow up our, our uh, egress fees. Okay. Um, now that we have our, our signed items, we can go ahead and, and stack it. Um, yeah, so this is uh, timed. Uh, this will take, yeah, less than a second to build the, the data array for these, you know, 300, I can't remember how many were left, but 350 some items. Um, in this case, uh, I'm going to select out just the bands that I care about. So the, um, if we go to the planetary uh, computer data catalog, um, and we'll go to Landsat specifically. Uh, we have a nice, again, this is built off the stack metadata. So it's not just like data arrays that you build. It's, you can build lots of stuff like HTML websites off the stack metadata. There's tons and tons of different bands. We're, we're only going to use the blue, green, red, and near infrared here. Um, so that finished loading up in the background there. The, uh, what, 80 gigs of data is now in distributed memory. And so we can start to do stuff with it, um, like take a, a median. So I, I think this is a, again, I'm learning geospatial, but this is like a pretty kind of common operation. Um, there are fancier ways to do it, I guess, but it's it's like a way to remove clouds from, from images. So, you know, we filtered out um, entire scenes, entire images that were too cloudy. Like when the USGS uh, produces the data, they measure like how, what portion of the scenes covered by clouds, uh, but that still leaves like some clouds in, in some images. So you can take like a median over time to remove uh, the clouds. And then you're just left, the idea being that the, the clouds are uh, transient. They're not gonna stick around through many, many images over, over years. Um, so we can take a median over time, uh, persist that in, in distributed memory as well. Um, and then if we wanna like start plotting it, we can take out a, a little subset here, a thousand by a thousand subset. Uh, and then we'll use X-ray uh, spatial's true color um, method to, to turn that from a, I forget what, these are like floats. I, I can't remember what the range is on these, but turn it from those into something that's uh, suitable for, for plotting. So it's doing that true color now. And then um, at some point we'll be pulling it back to, back to this client for plotting on the image. Uh, let's see here. So that, sh that should finish in, in just a second. And then we'll get like a nice little cloud-free mosaic of this uh, area over Iowa. If you want to guess what is going to be shown, 
uh, you'll be uh, unsurprised that it's a bunch of farmland. I'll let that finish up here. We can, uh, let's look at this, see if that's uh, more interesting. Uh, everyone knows about the cluster map plot, right? This is a good way to kill time while you're waiting for computations to finish because people are just mesmerized. Almost done. Okay, there we go. All right, so now we're kind of probably pulling this back locally. Yeah, and you can see it's probably done a pretty good job of, of removing clouds. And like I said, a bunch of farmland over Southeast Iowa. Okay, uh, another pretty common operation is uh, NDVI. So uh, normalized something difference of vegetation index. I can't remember exactly what it stands for. Um, the idea is, I guess it measures like uh, vegetable health by comparing the near infrared and the infrared bands somehow. Um, stack stack also has this uh, nice little helper method to stick these uh, data arrays onto um, an uh, IPy leaflet map. So you know we have our this is a Tumwa, it's a city in southeast Iowa, and we can you know pan and zoom around. And as we you'll notice uh, over here on the uh, dashboard scheduler task stream, uh, new new items are being loaded in as we pan and zoom around, and you can you know zoom out and do stuff like. Uh, yeah, look at what's going on. So here's Washington County, Iowa. It's famous for like uh, sustainable and regenerate, uh, regenerative agriculture. And we can, I don't know, look at pretty maps. Uh, I'm sure this is meaningful to, to people who know what they're doing. Um, okay, last one. Uh, so we have this, uh, going back to the full time series here, we have the, the full data set. Um, you know, this NDVI computation is just a bunch of universal functions like subtraction, division, addition. And so if you have a, a time series, so previously we, we did NDVI on a, a single um, uh, scene, a, the, the median at a single time step. But if you wanna do it on a whole bunch of them, you can just you know write out the operation. And, and again, we're using these core data structures, NumPy, uh, X-Ray, they know how to do, um, you know, they, they implement array u func basically. And so we can do these things uh, and get like a, a time series of NDVI. Um, I'm, I'm sure I did made tons of mistakes here. I pr probably should like smoothing stuff. I'm hitting issues with like partial scenes. But anyway, like you could clean this up and get a, a more meaningful NDVI. I doubt it's jumping around this much. It's probably like clouds or something. Okay. I'm gonna kill this one and move on to the next data set. So again, uh, my my very rough loose theme is like we have these core data structures numpy pandas x-ray um dask for scaling and you know we can do different time types of analysis work with different types of data so previously we we're using uh observation raster data coming down from satellites now we're going to use a, a data set that comes out of a um a, a a climate model is probably not a climate model, some sort of weather model. I don't know. It's DAMA. It's this um, uh, data set of things like precipitation, temperature, um, water, vapor pressure um, all over uh, North America. So there's North America, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. And again, you know, we, we have this in a czar cloud optimized format um, in, in West Europe. Um, we can open that up and see the, the variables here, like precipitation is you know, 3.35 terabyte array. Um, this is daily resolution, one kilometer grid for, for North America. And we can, you know, start working with it in, in under a second, which I, I think is pretty, pretty neat. Um, so I, again, you know, we, it's, I'm gonna keep hit, hitting this horse, uh, but uh, let me get my, uh, get my cluster here. I'll keep banging on this, but it's like really nice to have these, uh, these data structures like X-ray that we can use for these different kinds of data. So we don't have one just for, for satellite data. Um, the kind of operations you're doing, they may, may or may not be the same, like the processing, pre-processing would be probably different, but that's why uh, the domain specific libraries on top of these shared data structures. So when you're doing something like selecting data uh, by its X, Y coordinates, you know, you're gonna be using the exact same syntax. And when you have problems like this is uh, maybe not the most intuitive, this is some sort of Lambert conformal conic projection. I don't know, it'd be nicer to look this up by latitude and longitude. And so as the X-ray developers are, they're working on this right now is, you know, to be able to implement uh, index by other things like latitude, longitude for these projected data sets, like all the communities building on top of X-ray are gonna benefit from that. Um, so we are, here we have time of uh, maximum temperature daily maximum temperature. Um, again, I don't know if this is meaningful, but uh, it's uh, nice to look at. Um, 
now we're gonna take out a subset of data. Um, again, very much in the stuff I think is uh, cool to do. Uh, slice down this subset of data, this uh, five, uh, what is it? 2,500 by 2,100 uh, chunk. And then um, I'm not gonna do this here, but well, I'll do this first one. Basically make a little time series, a video of, of how temperature changes over time. So I've got it commented out here. It takes eight or so minutes, but I can uh, play the video, I think, uh, here. So this is over the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I, again, don't know if it's meaningful, but I think it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, a handful of lines of codes, so we can look at the how the temperature changes over daily for, what was this, four years or so? I can't actually remember. Um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's pretty neat. Maybe, I'm sure there are more meaningful things you could do, like the temperature anomaly or something. Uh, but yeah, that's a... Uh, that's pretty neat. Okay, I'm gonna kill that one as well. Again, uh, I'm gonna try to kill this cluster. I need my workers in my next notebook. Moving on to tabular data. So um, that was uh, you know gridded data, still in-dimensional data using um, X-ray. In this case, um, we have a copy of the USDA Forest Service uh, Forest Inventory Analysis. It's like the uh, census for trees, I guess, is the, how it's described. Um, pretty fun data set. Like if you're tired of working with the uh, New York City taxi cab data set, I'd recommend checking this one out. Again, you know, publicly accessible. Um, in this case, it's in Parquet format in uh, Azure Blob Storage. Uh, so I guess, I don't know the details. It's like a really, the PDF uh, user guide is like a thousand pages, but uh, this describes like the sampling methodology is they have these plots and within there they have subplots and then micro plots where they actually like measure a bunch of stuff about every tree inside that, that micro plot. Uh, you can do stuff, I don't really understand, but you can do stuff to somehow generalize that to, to the whole, um, I think it's all of, all of uh, the United States. Um, not just continental. So get, go ahead and, and get a cluster here. We're gonna read in these uh, data sets. So we have uh, information about all the plots. So that says things like the latitude, the approximate latitude and longitude of each plot. They do some, um, uh, what it's, it's not even like differential privacy, but it, they, they fuzz the data a bit so that um, you can't figure out who owns what land basically. Um, Anyway, uh, and we can go ahead and persist that in, in memory. So we have the data for the plots and then we have the data for all the trees, the actual measurements themselves. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and grab this URL and put it in here so we can see our dashboard. Um, all together, it's like 30, yeah, 35 gigs of, of data. Um, and then we can use our, our usual, you know, NumPy pandas syntax. So in this case, um, apparently, you know, I don't know the exact units of these measurements, but there's some sort of trees per acre adjustment that you need to make. Uh, so we'll go ahead and multiply the raw measurements for things like the above ground uh, biomass uh, and below ground biomass and then the carbon. So above and below ground, if you want to measure like how much uh, carbons sequestered, you know, in each acre of the United States or something like that. You could do that with this data set, uh, and then we'll convert from pounds to uh, to tons. Uh, yeah, um, and then in this case, we're going to group by state and county. So these are the FIPS codes. So um, together, these uniquely identify each county in the United States, and then we'll get the uh, count and sum. So we know like the number of trees and the uh, total biomass uh, above and below ground in the carbon. Okay, at this point, we just have a regular pandas data frame uh, back. So we've collapsed it from the, uh, how many how many rows was it? Lots of rows, 22, 223 million maybe, 22 million, um, down to the uh, 3,095 rows. Um, we can put that on a map. Uh, this is, again, uh, not strictly related to DAS, but there's some cool stuff going on in GeoPandas adjacent world where, um, so in this case, we're, we're getting the shape files or the GeoJSON shapes of each of these counties. We'll go ahead and join that uh, and use that as our, the uh, polygons as this geometry column. So now we have the boundaries for each of these counties and then using this GeoPandas viewer. Uh, so this isn't in GeoPandas yet, but it will be added soon. We can go ahead and plot the, um, what is this? The above ground uh, bio 
uh, sorry, the log of the above ground biology is like super skewed distribution. So this is like logs of tons. I don't know what the exact units are, but uh, again, it's pretty to look at. Uh, there's like some areas uh, here. Let me uh, try and make this big bigger. Anyway, there's some areas here in like California where it's super high and lower in the Midwest. I don't know. Again, experts can like, um, do, you know, say more about what this actually shows, but I think it's uh, just neat to play around with. Okay, cool. Uh, let's jump back. I'll actually kill that so that it can scale down. Um, again, you know, a, a very, very rough attempt at a summary to try and tie stuff together, but, you know, lots of groups are facing similar challenges, uh, um, especially around scaling. So like finance and geophysicists and uh, all sorts of people doing their own work are, are running into similar scaling challenges. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes the solutions to those challenges are the same. Um, and it also just gets uh, people talking to each other, which I think is useful in its own right. And then uh, since we're all using like these shared data structures like X-Ray, NumPy, Pandas, when we make an improvement to fix something in one domain, we typically fix it in others. And then open standards like Stack are, are making it easy to catalog this data set. So we can build stuff on top of that. Uh, and then, yeah, as I'm learning more and more about Jesus Spatial, it's like really, really hard, uh, but it's cool. You got to make some satisfying pictures. So um, if you want to learn more about what we're doing at the Planetary Computer, you can go there, planetarycomputer.microsoft.com. Uh, it's we're technically in, um, I forget what we're calling it, like private preview or beta or something. So it's like we're we're slowly granting access to bits and pieces, but the stuff you can do today that's like not gated behind a login, um, you can access all the data. Like I said, you just get throttled when you try and sign those things. Um, but maybe that's not a, a huge deal if you're dealing with relatively small data sets. And then we're going to be approving more signups um, over time. And then the, the materials for today, so the uh, slides and the notebooks will be here on this uh, scalable geospatial with Dask. And I'll post links in the chat and um, in the Slack as well. All right, that's it for me. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Well, thank you, Tom. That was really cool and definitely a lot of cool, fun plots and charts to look at. Yeah. So that was great. Somebody did ask about uh, about the notebooks, so just you know, yeah. as Tom said, he's gonna he's gonna go ahead and paste that in now, so you can grab them there um, from GitHub. Uh, there are a couple questions. If you have any more questions, dump them in the in the Zoom Q and A or in the chat right now. We have a couple minutes to to go through those. Um, a quick one. Um, somebody asked: Is at the beginning of the presentation, were you showing um, Pi Stack or a stack like kind of a, a different stack? Yep. Type? Yep. So this is uh, Pi Stack client is like the API. So stacks broken into the API, uh, the specification on one hand. This like describes what's in a stack item, and then an API spec specification on the other hand. And so Pi Stack client does the API part of things. It's like you know, implements the search uh, stuff, things like that um, on, on the client side. There's also a server side, which we won't get into. Um, so PyStack client uses PyStack to build up like stack items, things like that. Okay. And there, I think there was a related question. I think you just answered it because somebody asked if there was a relationship between PyStack client and SAT search. Uh, so I would say, uh, yeah, uh, Element 84, uh, Matt Hansen and a few others from Element 84 worked on both of them. I think that PyStack client is like the way to go in the future. Uh, so I would recommend uh, using it over SAT search, uh, but ask Matt Hansen if, if that's the fair summary. Cool. Um, all right. So there's another question here asking, uh, might have been a later part of the talk, asking if it would help if Raster.io could only load the data it needed instead of reading the entire file. So yes. there's an open uh, PR on, on the Raster.io from the person who asked the question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is David. I, I've been trying to follow this. I don't actually enter it. There's like a bunch of C code here. Uh, I, I Maybe, I don't know. I'm not actually sure what all Raster.io does right at that start there. Um, so I'm sure it would help a bit. Um, and then this just does other stuff that I don't fully understand. So I'm sure it would help a bit. Um, the cool thing about this, you know, PyStack client is like, if you do have stack items, then you can completely bypass opening files until you actually need to read data, which like is always going to be faster than speeding up reading files. But if you don't have stack items, then something like that would definitely be helpful. Cool. OK, so we got time for one more question. Um, Nick was asking, are polygon ob objects ragged columns? And are there any other awkward kind of data types in geospatial data sets? Um, I'm not actually sure. So there's. Um, uh, they're, they're, I think it's a bit confusing, uh, confusing to me anyway. So there's a project called PyGeos, um, which 
like uses a uh, geos, I think, or some sort of low level C library to describe these polygons. So um, anyway, it's, it's a little confusing, but I, the idea of that project is to have these, this like column of polygons in um, down in the sea level where it's like, you know, it has nice memory layout and all of that stuff. So I think I would roughly say is it's like mostly okay. Um, and, and then other awkward data types in geospatial, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are. Um, and yeah, I'm just, nothing's coming to mind right now. Okay, great. I was just answering one more on the chat. Okay, awesome. Well, we're gonna go ahead and move over to the next speaker, but thank you again so much, Tom, that was awesome. All right, thanks.